This is a Rotel RA920. It's about 25 years old and it's faulty, i.e. the left hand channel, there's no output from, from it whatsoever. So in this video we're going to have a little look and see what's wrong with it and hopefully fix it. The first thing to do is to take off the lid and have a look around inside for anything obvious like damaged capacitors, fire or evidence of fire or something like that. So let's take the lid off. First of all we just have a little look around inside and um, we're starting at the power supply end. A very generous transformer, nice stack on it, uh, shielded on the side with a copper band. This is the power amplifier section. Um, very nice heatsink. Bearing in mind it's only 20 watts per channel into 8 ohms, but it is a genuine 20 watts over the entire audio bandwidth. No peak program or anything like that. Um, so it is a good genuine 20 watts per channel. So bearing that in mind, the heatsink is more than generous. It, it should only get relatively warm when being driven. Now the next thing to notice is these two capacitors here. Um, they are the main smoothing capacitors and there is no sign of anything nasty coming out. There's no bulginess at the top there. I don't know whether you can see that. Let's zoom in a bit. It's a bit hard to see but there is no um, bulginess and there's no evidence of any leaking from these capacitors at all. And on the one channel that was working there is no audible hum from the um, um, quiescent conditions which would lead me to believe that there is nothing wrong with these capacitors. Now the area we have here is the disc EQ. It is the little preamp it comes from the phono and accepts a 3 millivolt input from the um, cartridge and also gives you RIAA correction and it's all done with that single chip there. That chip deals with both channels. That's basically the left channel and the right channel. So for modern day use, unless you have a turntable, that side of things is superfluous and useless. This is the left hand channel power amplifier with these are the output transistors and this smaller uh, power transistor is what deals with the quiescent conditions and makes sure that the, the bias is correct. And the same thing is duplicated on this channel but in, in reverse. This area is the main preamp which has the volume control pot immediately just out of sight here and is just basically to bring up the levels um, to a reasonable level for feeding directly into the power amplifier. Working in conjunction with this on the left hand side, these are all the passive components that deal with the bass and treble controls um, and that works in a feedback loop from the main preamp circuitry. So we've had a, a quick look around inside and I can confirm that none of the capacitors, um, at the moment by the way I'm just looking at the power amplifier. Um, we know that the power supplies are good simply because one channel is working and they both come off the same power supply. So there's no point in messing with the transformer or any of the components here or here. Um, so the next thing, next thing I'm going to do is check the output um, channels and see if we have any DC offset because that will be a good giveaway if something is wrong. Right, here we go. I've got the meter partly connected up to the speaker terminals and we're going to switch this to the 2 volts DC scale. At the moment it's open circuit, that's why it's flashing around. Um, both speaker terminals are common to ground, so I only have to clip onto one of them. Now, if there's a problem, there could be as much as 20 volts, plus or minus, um, on these terminals, which if you connect it to your loudspeakers, um, it's basically goodbye to the base unit. The treble unit tends to survive simply because it has a DC uh, or blocking capacitor in there which will stop any DC going to it. So the first thing you never do is connect it to a loudspeaker 
well, unless you want to commit suicide anyway. So we'll turn this on and it's now on and we should get a few millivolts on the output. Well that's the two volt scale so what's that? Um, nine millivolts roughly so which is which is nothing. Um, if it was going to be anything awful it would be 20 volts or close and we look on the other channel so both show near as damn it the same so we know we don't have any volts on the speaker so one could um, safely connect a speaker at this stage well the next stage is to have a look and see if there are any fuses blown because that is requires just simple observation and with the aid of the test meter, and I've got it on the buzzer at the moment, so it saves you having to look at the meter as well. Now the first two fuses, there's one here and there's one here. At the moment the power's off by the way, so it's quite safe for me to poke about here. So we look at, this is the good channel, and the fuse is okay. Here's the bad channel. Aha! Fuse is blown. Now that's interesting because as you notice from the previous tests we did have millivolts on the speaker terminals. Now how can that be if fuse is blown? Well let's have a look and see. Now looking at the circuit diagram this is the fuse and obviously if the fuse is blown, how can there be anything on the output? Well the answer is that resistor that, that bridges the fuse. Now as I was measuring the output open circuit, i.e. I had no loudspeaker or 8 ohm load across it, there's virtually no voltage drop across that resistor. So I'm actually seeing it's as if the fuse was okay. I'm actually measuring the few millivolts or that was actually there. I suspect the resist is actually in the circuit as it's part of the feedback loop which goes around here and if that should be completely open circuit it could make the amplifier unstable and do all sorts of horrible things but I'm not sure what that resist is actually for but that's my guess anyway. Now this is the amplifier that was faulty and I have the probe at the moment on one of the test points here and the other test point I'm going to touch onto that post there. Let's see if we can get a bit closer in focus. Yes, there you can see it clearly now. Now what this is, is the bias adjust. There's a small potentiometer just under the probe there and it says when the machine is hot, which at the moment it isn't, because um, I don't have a load or anything driving it but it will give us a fairly good idea to have a look at the bias and uh, I'm not going to adjust it unless necessary but it should be possible to compare the bias on the what was the good channel to what was the bad channel and it should be it says if you connect across there after the amplifier is reasonably warm which of course it isn't um, you'd expect to find about 4 millivolts across there. So if I touch that and swing around to the meter, well, it's alternating between 5 and 4 millivolts, which, oops, that's me moving. So that's pretty good. I, I shan't interfere with that. Now, needless to say, there are similar test points on the right-hand channel, which is working. So if I touch the probe on there, again it's exactly 4 millivolts. So I think we can be fairly confident saying that there is nothing wrong with either of the amplifiers, which is great news. Now just another quick look at the circuit diagram. Here is the variable potentiometer, which I could have adjusted um, to change the bias in the output transistors. And we were actually measuring here. This is the um, emitter of one of the trans points. So we were actually measuring the voltage drop across that 
emitter resistor which should have been four millivolts which was for all intents and purposes so we can effectively say that amplifier is biased exactly the same as the other one so no nasty things have happened to it that's the small track well the small large transistor if that makes sense also bolted on the heat sink which is basically that just looks after the thermal side as the transistor gets warm because of the heat sink um, it changes the current to stop it uh, developing thermal runaway basically and lots of smoke and nasty smells right it's uh, truth time now um, I've connected a small monitor speaker uh, which is my uh, little Wharfdale I've only brought one of them down because um, we know the other channel works but I will confirm that it's similar obviously I'm using this little transistor radio of similar vintage to use as a signal source I've just connected it to one of the numerous New Zealand radio stations and um, I've connected it into the tuner input simply because that's as good as any other input the only input I couldn't connect it to would be the phono input which it would grossly overload and distort terribly um, because one's three millivolts and the output of this would be in the region of 100 and 150 millivolts so the radio's on it's all plugged in the balance control the volume is just a little bit on so let's stand back and see what happens still in large plastic speakers anytime any place and just for a change there's advertisements new zealand is a bit like america for radio shit um, basically there's one record or two records and then there's 10 minutes of adverts well maybe not quite as bad as that but needless to say I listen to the BBC but I am British so what can you expect anyway seems to be working there's zero hum coming out of the channel out of the speaker That distortion, by the way, is because my hand was going across the radio and it was shielding it. The aerial is just landing on the floor, so I don't want to think that it's actually distorted. Right, I've actually found a station that's a bit more strength now. So I think we can say we have a, we can have a success there. I shall leave it running for a while and make sure nothing gets hot but I'm fairly optimistic that um, to coin a say coin a phrase we fixed it um, I'm only sorry that it wasn't something more entertaining because a fuse blown is a bit boring isn't it but nevertheless we've repaired it and bearing in mind that the only test equipment I have um, is my eyes my ears and that little um, test meter there um, years ago I had all the kit analyzers the scope and that would be the way you'd have to repair some of these amplifiers but um, it would be a different issue if we had distortion or something like that where you would probably need a scope to see where it's actually going wrong but because this was just a, a not working at all it was very easy to solve with the old wet finger and uh, test meter well it's been on about an hour now that dream home is a hidden nightmare and it's still working nicely and the heat sink bearing in mind i'm only driving one channel is stone cold um, i have been driving it relatively hard but only one channel um, so everything's wonderful i think transformers cold so all in all put it back together return it to my customer and um, oh the only other thing I'm going to do which I don't need to show you um, some of the pots are a little bit noisy and in fact one or two of the switches are slightly intermittent but I've got some contact spray which I shall spray into the switches but I'm sure if you're an avid technical youtuber you've seen that many times and I don't think I can add anything you just squirt it into the hole basically 
So I'll, I'll relieve you from that dubious pleasure and say thank you for watching and hope it's been a little bit interesting at least. Bye. And with me now is our good friend Dave Worsley to give us an update on the latest happenings at the US Tennis Open as we come to the end of the first week before we get to the business end next week. Well, Dave, disappointment there for both.